Welcome to Firearms Friday here with the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne. My name is Evan Green. I'm a volunteer here at the museum and for the last uh, 18 months or so I've been assisting the staff with updating the inventory on the firearms in the museum's permanent collection. And as we encounter firearms that have a good Wyoming story to them or firearms that were uh, unique in their operation or ones that we know were used in Wyoming but don't necessarily have a good story, we intend to share those with you guys uh, through our Firearms Friday program. And today I want to talk about the gun that won the West. If you've watched Western movies or are a student of the American frontier, you may have heard that phrase, the gun that won the West, and it is often applied to Winchester lever actions or Colt single action revolvers. So, when was the West won? Um, a historian named uh, Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893, as a part of his frontier thesis, said that the frontier was closed as of 1890, in that there was not a definable line that identified the frontier. So let's take 1890 as a target date and talk about those Colt revolvers and Winchester rifles. Samuel Colt patented his first revolver in 1836, so a little over 50 years in use. The first Winchester rifle was the model 1866, the first one to bear the Winchester name, and obviously that was put in production in 1866, so maybe 35 years. Well, I'm gonna make the case today that the gun that won the West was one of these Northwest trade guns. The trade gun was introduced to the American continent about 1630, 1640, concurrent with the uh, introduction of the flintlock ignition system. So 1630, 1640, the use of these firearms continued well into the 20th century. The Hudson Bay Post at Winnipeg carried muzzle-loading shotguns, which is basically what we have, in its stores until 1936. And sources say that these firearms were still in use uh, up to and maybe past that date in remote parts of Canada. So okay, Northwest trade guns need to be clear that the Northwest they're referring to was like Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, the area around the Great Lakes, which was the Northwest in those days. So why was this introduced into the trade on the North American continent? Well, they were anxious, both the French and the British, were anxious to acquire furs, particularly beaver pelts. So, um, why beaver pelts for two or three hundred years? The under fur on a beaver, particularly the belly fur, is the perfect material to make felt hats, like this one, although this one is not very much beaver in it. But beaver hats were all the rage in Europe for, again, this period of time. So during that period, there was a varying ratio of what it would cost in beaver pelts to acquire uh, one of these muskets. And it varied from 30 to 50 pelts, depending on the region and the, the time. So again, these were in use for over 300 years. Incidentally, I, I looked up, uh, and beaver fur is still used to make high dollar felt hats. You can pay between $1,000 and $5,000 for a felt hat that is 100% beaver. So anyway, Let's look at these trade muskets. They're equivalent to about a 20 gauge shotgun, uh, 0.61 something in caliber, and very versatile because with uh, the smooth bore, you can load powder and then bird shot for small game, buck shot for medium game, or you can load a round ball, which is fairly efficient for larger game. So this one here is in really good shape. It is marked on the Lock, Parker Field Company, 1875 London. 
So we know that this one was made in 1875 and found its way uh, to the United States or Canada. Um, a little late, percussion firearms kind of came into vogue uh, and about 1830. They were slow to be adopted as anything new usually is or was in those days. So let's talk about this flintlock ignition system for a minute. In order to load this firearm, you would first put a measured charge of black powder followed by your projectile of choice. Then you would open this unit right here and you would put a finer grained black powder into this uh, receptacle right here. And then you would close this, which is called the frizzin. So to get a shot off, you would cock the hammer and when you pull the trigger, uh, two things would happen. If you're lucky and the wind isn't blowing or it's not raining, the impact of the flint on the frizzin would shoot a shower of sparks into this pan. And if that powder went off, and if you were lucky, that charge would be conveyed into the black powder charge at the rear of the rifle. So there were some certain defining character characteristics of the Northwest gun. One is this dragon side plate or sea serpent side plate, um, which was again a defining feature, as was this large trigger guard. And there's a couple of theories about the trigger guard. One is that it was called a mitten guard so that you could pull the trigger with your gloves or your mittens on. Uh, a competing theory is that the Native Americans were accustomed to pulling their bow and releasing the arrow with two fingers. This allowed them to use that technique with the uh, musket. So, again, this one's in really excellent condition. Uh, another characteristic were these finials, decorative elements on the stock, um, and also on the front and rear of the trigger guard assembly here. So, uh, again, this one's in really good condition. So we'll take a minute and look at one that's a little different. This one shows evidence of hard use, to put it mildly. But again, it has the serpent side plate and the large musket trigger guard, the finials on the trigger guard assembly. This one is unmarked except for a proof mark that, if my research is accurate, indicates that it was made in Birmingham, England, not in London. Birmingham manufacturers were a competitor for the London firearms. So this one has obviously been converted from flintlock to percussion ignition system. A couple ways we know that. You can see these holes here in the side, which is where the frizzin and pan would have been attached. And it's obvious that this receptacle for the percussion cap is also added at the time it was converted from flintlock to percussion. Another clue is the amount of corrosion in this area. When it was a flintlock and that shower of sparks went into the pan, not all of them were captured there and they tended to corrode this area at the breach of the firearm. This one also, uh, the stock has been broken and repaired in this area right here. And this is a fairly common uh, thing that we see with uh, firearms that had hard usage. If they were dropped or uh, beat up, uh, they would break right here at the wrist. So anyway, um, again, these firearms were obviously in use in, across the American continent. Uh, Lewis and Clark found them, encountered them uh, the entire way with almost every tribe having, and they called them fusils in those days, was one of the names. Um, by 1850, they were being traded for, to the Comanche for horses. Um, so again, in use until well into the 20th century. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, you can make them below or call us and we can arrange to have you come by the museum for a chat.